Today we will learn and reflect on the Vatican II decree of religious freedom. This was a controversial decree which surprised me and possibly most America since we view freedom of religion as a core value in Western culture. But American history differs from European history, so we will ponder why this was such a controversial decree that was debated in multiple Vatican II sessions spanning several years. We will show how these Vatican II changes were not forced from above by liberal popes, but were supported by bishops from around the world. Many commentators underemphasized the huge impact the World War II experiences had on the history of Vatican II. But Vatican II is totally unimaginable without the vast changes this war against fascism and Nazism wrought. The Catholic monarchies had been swept away in two great wars, but the Catholic Church had mixed and disastrous experiences with the various fascist regimes of World War II. And this decree also confronts the question, is democracy a friend or a foe of the Catholic Church? At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for our video. You're welcome to follow along in the PowerPoint script on SlideShare. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. Contrary to the impressions of many, Vatican II did not introduce any theological reforms. Vatican II rather sought to share with the world the theology of the original Reformed Council, which was the Council of Trent. What Vatican II changed was the political philosophy of the Catholic Church. Under Vatican II, the Catholic Church recognizes that totalitarianism is either the enemy or a false friend of the Church, and it embraces democracy as the best friend of the Church. Vatican II marks a dramatic shift in the Church's attitude towards the modern secular world. Gone are the anathemas that condemn those who may disagree with the teachings of the Church. Instead, Vatican II seeks dialogue with the modern world in a pastoral rather than a condemning attitude. The Vatican II decree on religious freedom announced that democracy and freedom of religion and conscience were the friends of the Church, and that a totalitarian form of government could never be a trustworthy friend of the Catholic or Christian Church. The Vatican II Declaration on Religious Freedom, or Dignitatis Humanae, teaches us that governments should not only tolerate reluctantly religious freedom, but should rather seek to encourage a healthy civil environment in which religious worship and institutions can thrive, encouraging the religious and the whole society to live a more moral and godly life. In the spirit of Vatican II, we should recognize that a striving democracy is essential to guarantee that the Church can fulfill its mission, and that believers should never demonize any political party simply because the Church does not agree with every single one of the planks in their platform. We especially should not demonize a political party that enthusiastically champions the doctrine of social justice, because this doctrine of social justice is central to so many papal decrees and encyclicals since Rerum Novarum was issued over a century ago, as was reaffirmed in Pope Francis's recent decree. Now we'll first discuss Passum and Terrace, the papal decree that helped pave the way for the Vatican II decree on religious liberty. Passum and Terrace summarize the Catholic teaching on religious liberty, which is also known by its English title of Establishing Universal Peace and Truth, Justice, Charity, and Liberty. This was the last papal encyclical issued by Pope John XXIII, the Pope who opened the windows of the Church by calling the Vatican II Church Council. And this was the first papal encyclical to be published in full by the New York Times, and it radically influenced Catholic social teaching up to the present leading to a UN Council on Social Justice attended by theologians and statesmen from around the world. Passamenteris teaches us that the rights modern man can demand from their government, such as freedom of religion, are inseparable rights, all of which are guaranteed only if the government is ruling justly, proactively seeking to guarantee that all citizens, no matter how humble, can look forward to a life of adequate opportunity free from tyranny. Passamenteris was written in the long tradition of Catholic teachings on social justice, starting with Rerum Novarum, the papal pronouncement on the need to provide a living wage and safe working conditions to the working poor, and was an influence on the policies of the New Deal during the Great Depression of the 1930s. 
The decree starts with the ringing declaration. Peace on earth, which man throughout the ages has so longed for and sought after, can never be established, can never be guaranteed, except by the diligent observance of the divinely established order. Now, Catholic doctrine does not change. Church teaching does not change, but political systems do change. And technology continues to advance with remarkable inventions and processes, which have moral implications, I might add. Passamentaris celebrates that a marvelous order predominates in the world of living beings and in the forces of nature, which is the plain lesson which the progress of modern research and the discoveries of technology teach us. And it is part of the greatness of man that he can appreciate that order and harness these forces to benefit mankind. Now what has not changed, but which modern man often forgets, is that man was created in the image of God and entrusted to be the Lord of creation. What also has not changed is the fact that the moral laws apply to all people regardless of their rank in society. Many modern men are deluded into believing that the moral law only binds individual men to behave properly to one another, but Passamentaris reaffirms that the moral law also applies to relationships between men and the state, and to international disputes and behavior between states and between states and international institutions like the UN, the World Bank, and the IMF. Also affirmed by Passamentaris is that man has a right to live. He has a right to live with dignity, with sufficient food, clothing, and shelter, medical care, rest, and necessary social services, to be cared for when he is sick, disabled, widowed, elderly, or when he cannot earn a living through no fault of his own. Man should be guaranteed freedom from harassment, freedom of speech, and being able to get a good education and realize his potential regardless of his class or wealth. The right of freedom of religion is not seen as a freedom in isolation, and it is listed among a series of many other freedoms. Man has the right to worship God according to the right dictates of his own conscience, and to profess his religion both in private and in public. And Passamentera says, hence too Pope Leo XIII, who issued the encyclical Rerum Novarum, declare that true freedom, freedom worthy of the sons of God, is that freedom which most truly safeguards the dignity of the human person. It is stronger than any violence or injustice. Such is the freedom which has always been desired by the church and which she holds most dear. It is the sort of freedom which the apostles resolutely claimed for themselves. The apologists defended it in their writings. Thousands of martyrs consecrated it with their blood. Worker rights championed by Rerum Novarum are reiterated. Workers should be paid a living wage and labor under safe and humane conditions. And just as important, private property rights should not be violated. But with these property rights come a social obligation to treat the workers and the poor fairly. Passamentaris teaches us that men should be guaranteed most of the rights in the American Bill of Rights and the Four Freedoms, which was FDR's New Deal declaration near the end of World War II, declaring that every man should be granted not only the freedom of speech and expression and the freedom to worship God in his own way, but also the freedom from want and the freedom from fear. Also, men should be guaranteed the right to emigrate and immigrate when there are just reasons for it. And refugees should be treated with kindness, since we are all citizens of the worldwide community of men. With these rights come the responsibility to protect these rights for others, treating all with dignity. Dignitatis Humanae was one of the most controversial decrees of Vatican II, discussed in several sessions. The first five drafts were rejected as inadequate or incomplete. Over 500 comments were submitted by bishops or other interested Catholic parties, and the sixth draft was finally approved in the third session after many, many hours of debate. And John Courtney Murray was the leading theologian from America that was behind the push for religious freedom. In Murray's words, the final decree denies the concept of a double standard, freedom for the church where Catholics are a minority, and privilege for the church and intolerance for others where Catholics are a majority. Murray describes the freedom of religion as being in three tiers. First, religious liberty is a human right and a personal freedom and a collective freedom for the citizenry. Second, religious liberty is a political doctrine on the functions and limits of government in religious affairs. Finally, religious liberty is a theological doctrine that governs the relationship between the church and the state. 
Now, Cardinal Wyatola, the future Pope John Paul II, because of his experiences suffering under a persecuted church in communist Poland, emphasizes how the decree on religious liberty protects not only individuals, but also religious communities. Reluctant toleration that seeks to suffocate the church is not religious liberty. A moral society must allow its citizens the freedom to develop as communities, as man is a social animal. Citizens must be allowed to honor their God in public worship, practice their religion, and be allowed to instruct their children, members, and clergy in the faith. Citizens must not be forced to send their children to public schools that mock and denigrate religion, as happened in most communist countries. Cardinal Ratzinger, future Pope Benedict XVI, summarized the opposing debates regarding the decree on religious liberty. The conservative side, led by the Spaniards, argued that those who are in error in their beliefs do not have the same right as those who believe in the truth. Also, religious liberty was seen as irresponsibility towards truth. The deeper argument is whether the concept of religious liberty was based on a concept of natural law, which lacked sufficient scriptural foundation. In other words, does the concept of religious liberty run counter to the accepted traditions and teachings of the church? The opposing argument is that religious liberty in no way decreases the importance of seeking the truth, nor does it deny the truth of the gospel and our salvation gained through Christ's resurrection. Cardinal Ratzinger repeats Murray's argument a faith which demands, on the basis of its universality, universal freedom to preach its message to all the nations in the midst of their religious traditions, must also affirm freedom of belief, otherwise it would contradict itself. Double standards are not honest. Cardinal Ratzinger remembers the floor speech by Cardinal Baran, who was imprisoned for many years for proclaiming the Catholic faith in communist Czechoslovakia, who was exiled when he attended Vatican II. Baran arose and gave his unconditional support to the text on religious liberty, pointing to the history of his country where violent suppression of the Hussite movement had inflicted wounds on the Catholic faith that still have not been healed. Now, Cardinal Baran was referring to a historical incident that was a root cause for the radicalism of the Protestant Reformation by Luther. John Huss had been summoned to the Council of Constance to answer to charges of heresy for his proto-Protestant beliefs under a guarantee of personal safety issued by the Holy Roman Emperor. This promise of safe passage was ignored, and John Huss was burned at the stake. A Catholic army sent to the Czech provinces was defeated, and a settlement was negotiated. Catholicism was restored with much bitterness. You cannot find in scriptures any direct quotation on freedom of religion, because that was just not an issue in the ancient world. In pagan Rome, the worship of the gods was a patriotic duty, and after Emperor Constantine, the Christian emperors were protectors of Christianity, as the educated bishops and priests ran the state bureaucracy and judicial system. But religious liberty is implied in the many passages that teach us that men must be persuaded rather than forced to accept the faith, and that we are saved by choice and not by force. Cardinal Ratzinger teaches us that the New Testament testifies to God's weakness that he chose to approach man not with legions of angels, but solely with the gospel of his word and the testimony of a love ready to die for the salvation of men. The final draft that was approved put more emphasis on three main points. First, the unchanging claim that the Catholic Church is the only true religion is affirmed. Second, religious liberty does not compromise the true faith. Freedom is a vulnerable privilege. It can easily destroy itself if used without restriction. Freedom should not be abused. And finally, the decree leaves intact the traditional Catholic doctrine on the moral duty of men and communities toward the true religion and the only Church of Christ. And these are some excerpts from the decree on the above points. Uh, from Dignitatis Humanae, the government should create conditions favorable to the fostering of religious life so that people may be truly enabled to exercise their religious rights and to fulfill their religious duties, and so society itself may profit by the moral qualities of justice and peace which originate in man's faithfulness to God and to his holy will. This decree leaves untouched the traditional Catholic doctrine on the moral duty of men and societies toward the true religion and toward the one Church of Christ. For Americans, what is puzzling is why a declaration of religious freedom is not obvious and why bishops would argue over this decree over three sessions of Vatican II, and why would it need to go through six drafts? 
The United States was the first major country to guarantee the freedom of religion in our founding documents. And the American bishops led by John Courtney Murray led the council in the formulation on the final drafts on religious freedoms. To understand this controversy over the doctrine of religious liberty, we need to quickly review European history from classical times up to modern times. In the early Roman Empire, the worship of the gods was a civil duty, and after Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity, the emperor saw himself as the protector and head of the church. Following the fall of the Western Roman Empire, the kings of Spain, France, and England, and the Holy Roman Emperor continued to see themselves as little Constantines, as protectors of the church, and insisted on the right to appoint bishops and abbots in their territories, which is known as the Investiture Controversy. These binding ties between the monarchies and the Catholic Church were part of the medieval ideal of three cooperating classes. The class of the nobles, those who fought. The class of the clerics and the monks, those who prayed. And the class of the serfs and the peasants, those who worked. All of creation was seen as a great chain of being. All of creation was seen as a hierarchy emanating downward from the Almighty, to the angels, to the kings, then the bishops, to the princes and nobles, and down to the serfs and the peasants, and then downward to the rest of creation. The church was the sole possessor of the truth of Catholicism through the authority of the scriptures and the writings of the church fathers, which only the church had the wisdom to properly interpret. But Martin Luther tore down the first pillar of medieval society when he denied the legitimacy of papal authority and challenged the validity of many long-standing church doctrines. And to a certain extent, his hand was forced when he was simply ordered simply to recant his beliefs without debate, recant he would not, with his famous here I stand, I cannot do otherwise declaration. And we've already discussed how John Huss uh, guaranteed that the Protestant Reformation, when it came, would be very radical. Now, Luther was able to keep a lid on the tensions between rulers, but after his death, the Thirty Years' Wars erupted first as wars of religion and evolved into wars of conquest, causing widespread casualties and suffering in Europe. These incessant wars and theological conflicts between Catholics and Protestant, each side claimed to be the sole guardian of the truth, this also led to the separation of theology and philosophy, giving rise to the Enlightenment, where the philosophers were the enlightened ones, not the squabbling theologians and clerics. The endless Thirty Years' Wars were ended by the Treaty of Westphalia, and this ended the endless cycles of wars with the diplomatic solution that the king or prince would determine the religion of his own state. And after the Reformation, various political settlements of disputes between Catholics and Protestants developed the concept of religious freedoms. The Anabaptists and later the Baptists were early proponents of religious freedom. And the Eating of Nantes in France guaranteed the rights of Protestants in Catholic France, and this was a major step forward in the drive to religious freedom. Now, the binding ties between the Catholic Church and the French monarch, Louis XIV, proved deadly in the French Revolution. The king and all the nobility lived idle, extravagant lives in the Palace of Versailles. The top 1% were taken way too much from the other 99%, many of whom were trapped in lives of perpetual poverty and misery. Some peasant priests escaped the carnage of the French Revolution. Church properties were seized by the state, never to be returned, and many priests who refused allegiance to the revolution were executed. Many of those who did not refuse were later executed anyway. The madness ended somewhat when Napoleon seized power and signed a concordat with the captive pope, once again recognizing the role of the church in society, calling a truce between believers and unbelievers. The Napoleonic Code, adopted across Europe, enshrined the principles of liberty, equality, and fraternity, the slogan of the French Revolution, and provided a common legal framework across continental Europe, protecting the legal rights of all classes. Now, what were the long-term consequences for the Church? The Catholic Church was seen as the guardian of monarchical privileges, while the revolutionaries were seen as the guardians of the lower and middle classes and the French Revolution accelerated the anti-clerical attitudes of many French and indeed many Europeans. And we see obvious symbolism in the coronation of Napoleon. Centuries prior, when Charlemagne was crowned emperor, he was crowned emperor by the Pope. But Napoleon, in his coronation ceremony, grabbed the crown from the hands of the Pope and crowned himself. Now the Popes were sympathetic to monarchs and monarchy because until the Risorgimento, or the unification of Italy in modern times, the Pope was a monarch himself of the Papal States in the middle of Italy. 
Now this was an historical necessity. In the 8th century, the Byzantine army was not able to protect Rome from the sack of the barbarian armies. So the Pope instead requested protection from the Frankish kings. But there was a problem. The Frankish court was north of the Alps, and Rome was south of the Alps. So they really couldn't protect them. So Pepin, the first Frankish king, donated the former possessions of the Lombards, whom he defeated, to the Pope so he could field an army that would help protect Rome from the barbarians and other enemies, and also provide a little bit of a tax base so he could raise an army. And this was the famous donation of Pepin. It was only the rise of the modern secular state that made the old hotly contested issue of investiture disappear. And investiture was the debate over who would appoint powerful bishops and abbots, the state or the church. The reunification of Italy deprived the Catholic Church over her jurisdiction over the papal states, which meant that the Pope was no longer a worldly monarch. The Lateran Treaty of 1927 between the Vatican and Mussolini's Italy permanently resolved that the papal states belonged to Italy and that Vatican City would be a small independent city-state of the Catholic Church existing within the Italian state in Rome. Now, World War I swept away many of the monarchies remaining in Europe. The response of the Catholic and Protestant churches to fascism and the murderous anti-Semitism culminating with World War II was mixed. Before Hitler, the church's enemy was communism. The Spanish Civil War, which was a practice run for the Battle of Stalingrad, saw bloody massacres on both sides, but the communists were the ones who massacred the priests. The Nazis in Germany were a mass movement, and Hitler was every bit as popular then as Trump is today. Among the Protestants, only about a fifth of the churches were confessing churches protesting against Nazism, while a fifth of the German churches were German Christian churches who denied the authority of the Old Testament, even denying that Jesus was a Jew and supported the persecution of the Jews. And the rest of the German Protestants were like tepid dishwater. They didn't want to take a political stand against Nazism. And this same sort of split occurred in the Catholic Church in Germany as well. Pope Pius XII was Pope during World War II. Many scholars accuse him of being too cautious in his dealings with Hitler, but he faced a dilemma. If he spoke out too forcefully, Hitler would simply murder more priests along with the Jews. Many priests were martyred in the death camps. One famous martyr is the Polish priest, St. Maximilian Kolbe. Officially, the Vatican was neutral, but during the war, he had many German Catholic priests deliver a protest sermon on Easter Sunday on the brutality of the fascist regime. Multiple encyclicals were issued protesting against totalitarianism, and the Vatican officials covertly saved the lives of many thousands of Jews, hiding them in the monasteries and convents and schools and buildings in the Vatican. However, Hitler was not totally unaware of this. He planned to execute the Pope and his bishops after he won the war. The response of the French Catholics to fascism was more problematic. When France fell, the leftist Republican government officials fled to form a government in exile, leaving behind the religiously conservative French officials who formed the Vichy wartime government that collaborated with the Nazis. In contrast, most of the leadership and membership of the French resistance were communists. The Vichy government was led by a virulent anti-Semite, the hero of World War I, General Pétain. The French Revolution slogan of liberty, equality, and fraternity were replaced by the Vichy slogan of work, family, and fatherland. The foundations of the Vichy government were simultaneously pro-Catholic, pro-life, pro-fascist, and anti-communist. Vichy officials often eagerly hunted down the Jews and helped the Nazis pack them on the death trains headed for the concentration camps, and this did not help the reputation of the Catholic Church either. The government of fascist Italy was nominally a constitutional monarchy, and Mussolini, although he was not a good Catholic, was every bit the friend of the Catholic Church that the old Catholic monarchs were, ensuring that Italy was a Catholic state. However, on the eve of World War II, Mussolini went full Nazi and started persecuting the Jews, which was quite a shock and a betrayal of Pope Pius XII. After the war, King Victor Emmanuel III, who tolerated Mussolini up to the very end, abdicated, and Italy became a secular republic. Now, taking this history into account, so we'll try to summarize the emotions of many European Catholics after World War II who opposed religious liberty. And this was a reconstruction of their possible reasons for their emotions. Religious liberty was associated with Protestants, not Catholics. 
Religious liberty was associated with democracy. Democracy was associated with the French Revolution and anti-clericalism. And communism persecuted and martyred Christians and resembled the French Revolution. And many Catholics preferred monarchies and authoritarians to protect the Catholic faith. And the feeling that the church and the state, and not laymen, should make the rules. And another deeply felt emotion, the faith should never change. We must not forget the dates when Vatican II councils were held, which was 1962-65. to 65. This was only 20 years after the end of World War II, and many attending bishops suffered through the war years. And Cardinal Waitaila, later Pope John Paul II, I hope I'm saying that right, luckily escaped death by working as a laborer in Poland. Cardinal Ratzinger, later Pope Benedict XVI, was forced into joining the Hitler Youth in the ending days of the war, and quickly left his post as soon as he could. And Yves Congar served in the French army and was a POW in Germany, escaping attempt many times. When Pope John Paul XXIII decided to throw open the windows of the church to let in the fresh air from the modern world, he was enthusiastically supported by many bishops around the world. World War II had changed the world forever. The old Catholic monarchies were long gone, and now the progressive states of Europe were all democracies. Pope John XXIII wanted Vatican II to be a council of all Catholics, including both the traditional Catholics and the new reforming Catholics, and those reforming Catholics who'd so often been silenced in the years preceding Vatican II, including Yves Congar. The original schemas for Vatican II were mostly drafted by the traditional cardinals and bishops of the Curia in Rome. The Pope and the Church sought consensus and overwhelming majorities for all the Vatican II constitutions and decrees. The original Vatican II schema on ecumenicism included a chapter on religious liberty. Cardinal Bay and many bishops knew that the Catholic Church wanted to be included in the ecumenical discussions between the churches. It would have to affirm the rights of the Christians to pr practice their faith. In his opening speech to the Council, Pope John XXIII distinguished between ancient doctrine and how it was presented. The former never changed but the presentation evolved according to changing political realities. The Vatican II scheme on ecumenicism made one major break from the Catholic past. Missing was the call for the other Christian communities to return to the Mother Catholic Church. The Council Fathers felt that the Catholic Church needed to be less polemic and more ecumenical when reaching out to their fellow Christian brethren. The Catholic doctrine on matters like ecumenicism and religious liberty was not fundamental to the core moral and theological beliefs of the Church. And indeed, the Church was sometimes at fault when overly polemic fervor overwhelmed the underlying Christian message and the good news of the Gospel. And religious liberty was a controversial topic. Religious liberty was either comforting or threatening to the faith, depending on the region. In America, religious freedom was a guaranteed constitutional right that helped Christianity thrive. But in Latin America, aggressively polemic American evangelicals were eager to poach the Catholic faithful. But in the communist Eastern Bloc, the persecuted church dreamed of guaranteed rights to religious liberty so the church could thrive. In continental Europe, many Catholics equated religious liberty with the ideas of the French Revolution and its hatred of all things religious. While in Italy and Spain, the Catholic Church was granted preferential treatment by the state. And they ask, would a new emphasis on religious liberty lead to a loss of faith in these countries? During the debate, Ruffini, an opponent, summed up five points that at that time were listed in every seminary textbook. First, Christ founded only one church, the Roman Catholic Church. Second, faults cannot be attributed to the church as such, but only to its members. Third, to leave the church because of its sinful members is itself a sin. Fourth, the one true church fervently hopes for the return of the Protestants. And fifth, dialogue with non-Catholics is good only if done according to the guidelines published by the Holy See. Pope John XXIII had appointed the American bishop, John Courtney Murray, as the theological advisor on religious liberty. Like many theologians who led the debates of Vatican II, Murray had also been silenced by the Vatican for his teachings and writings on religious liberty. Murray emphasizes Lincoln's assertion that all men are created equal. Murray explains that the main difference between America and Europe, in America, pluralism was the native condition of American society, while in Europe, pluralism was caused by the decay of Catholic unity. 
Also, American political philosophy was influenced by the more conservative British legal tradition that respects the sovereignty of God. And the American experience is very different from the radical French Jacobin laicist tradition that had become hostile to religious influence of any sort. Now, there's a difference between freedom in the American sense, freedom from tyranny, freedom from government interference, freedom to do what I wish as long as I do not harm others. In contrast, in the Catholic view, freedom comes with responsibility, and the responsibility to work for the good, to live a godly life. As Pope Benedict teaches, freedom is not so much concerned with what I want, but rather freedom concerns itself with what God wants. Religious freedom is not absolute, neither in America nor in Europe. In America, you cannot shield the practice of polygamy, nor can you smoke peyote or indulge in any other psychotic drug as an exercise of religious liberty. Likewise, in Europe, you're not allowed to deny the reality of the Holocaust. That is illegal. And the debate continued in the third session in Vatican II and 64. Arguing for the decree on religious liberty, the theologian de Smet argued that the human dignity granted by the redemption of Christ means that all men are called to seek their conscience, to seek and follow the will of God in their lives. And that has always been the teaching of the church, reaching back to the teachings of the ancient church fathers. That genuine faith must be free and sincere and cannot be coerced. Government should honor this religious freedom so religious organizations are not simply tolerated but are encouraged to grow and thrive. Arguing against religious liberty, Ruffini argued that since there is only one true religion, it does not admit freedom of choice. We are only truly free if we embrace the true teaching of the church. Cardinal Ottaviani clarified the opposition. I do not understand why a person who errs is worthy of honor. I understand that the person is worthy of consideration, of tolerance, of cordiality, of charity. But I do not understand why he is worthy of honor and Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre of France, who would later leave the church rather than support the Vatican II decrees, predicted ruin for the church if this decree were adopted. Now Murray contributed to the further revisions of Dignitatis Humanae. It was once again debated at the fourth period of Vatican II in 1965. The Canadian and American bishops were enthusiastically supportive, while the Spanish bishops were nearly unanimous in their opposition. The Spanish bishops argued that only the Catholic Church had the right to preach the gospel. The proselytizing Catholics was illicit and should be forbidden by both church and state. Cardinal Ariba y Castro added, Let the council take care not to declare the ruin of the Catholic Church in nations where Catholicism is the only religion practiced. Marcelo Lefebvre was also adamantly opposed. And the speech by the unrelated Joseph Lefebvre helped sway many bishops to support the decree. And his argument is summarized by O'Malley, the historian. First, the decree would not foster subjectivism and religious indifference. Second, it would not mean that the council abdicated the position that the Catholic Church was the only church of Jesus Christ. Third, it would not have a bad effect because of the dissemination of error. Fourth, it would not diminish missionary spirit. Fifth, it does not exalt human beings at God's expense. And sixth, it does not contradict church doctrine. Finally, a vote was taken on the revised Dignitatis Humanae. The Pope wanted a strong majority to vote for religious liberty. Uh, Pope Paul IV would, felt he would be embarrassed if it barely passed before he would soon be speaking before the United Nations. The vote on the scheme passed by a healthy majority of 90%. Controversially, the final vote was delayed until the fifth session the revised and final decree passed by an overwhelming majority. Now what happened after Vatican II? Many years later Cardinal Ratzinger would comment on the status of missions in Africa and he said that though Vatican II introduced necessary changes in its affirmation of religious liberty that the effect of this decree and broader decree on ecumenicism did indeed lead to a lessening of missionary zeal. Cardinal Ratzinger observes that hand-in-hand hand with the weakening of the necessity of baptism went the overemphasis on the values of the non-Christian religions, which many theologians saw not as extraordinary paths of salvation, but precisely ordinary ones. Naturally, hypotheses of this kind caused the missionary zeal of many to slacken. Many began to wonder, why should we disturb non-Christians, urging them to accept baptism and faith in Christ, 
if their religion is their way to salvation in their culture in their part of the world. And the risk is that we lose the link between the truth of the gospel and salvation. Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre balked at signing this decree, and with some followers left the church to found the Society of St. Pius X, rather than agree to the decrees of Vatican II. They could not accept the decrees of religious liberty, the new openness of, to the non-Christian religions, and the reform of the clergy. After ordaining bishops without papal authorization, Marcel Lefebvre was formally excommunicated from the Catholic Church. In the years following Lefebvre's death, Pope Benedict lifted the excommunication. Now, Dr. Wikipedia lists the legal status of the Society of St. Pius X as canonically irregular, with some recognition from the Vatican. And also, Pope Benedict was very embarrassed when one of the Lefebvre bishops was convicted by a German court of denying the Holocaust. Many influential Catholics were no doubt disappointed that Bishop Lefebvre would cause a schism in the church, mostly over the issue of religious liberty. This schism sowed seeds of weeds and tares which grow amongst the weed of the faithful up to the current day. Could this rebellion against the overwhelming majority consensus of the Church Fathers of Vatican II be considered a rebellion against the truth set forth by the Church? Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. And my major sources are John O'Malley's books and lectures on what happened to Trent and what happened to Vatican II. And my recommendation is to both read and listen to his books and his lectures. In my humble opinion, you cannot form a true picture of Catholicism in the modern world without reading John O'Malley's books on these topics. When I read John Murray Courtney's books on religious freedom, it sounded like a repetition of what I learned in multiple civics and history lectures, as indeed it is with just a little bit of a Catholic explanation. We recorded a video discussing the many books we will consult on the history and moral teachings of Vatican II and its decrees to avoid being too repetitive in our videos. The Catechism directly references the decree on religious liberty in many places, including the commandments, do not slander in the first commandment to love God with the truth and with a genuine and dedicated love. So what does religious liberty have to do with the commandment, do not slander, and also the primary commandment to love God with all of our heart? We will investigate this in another companion video. The YouTube description links to the video script and our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. And please click on the links for interesting videos on other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.